Hi, Carl Steele again, English 4113, class three. We're talking in this about Thomas Brown's Pseudodoxia Epidemica and also the bit about academic book reviews. So the key thing to understand about Brown is his relentless skepticism. The book literally means, the title of the book means, A Plague of Pseudoscience. So you can imagine that a book like this could be very useful now in the 21st century just as it was in the 17th century when Brown was writing. And if you look at the ending of sections six, uh, section 11 of that, um, which is the second of his two sections about uh, dark skin color, you can see a description of his deep skepticism and of his method. And there he writes in that last paragraph, lastly, it is a very injurious method unto philosophy and a perpetual promotion of ignorance to fall upon a present refuge unto miracles or recur unto immediate contrivance from the unsearchable hands of God. That's a little difficult to understand. And I have to confess that I myself spent maybe 20 minutes or so looking at the various words in this in the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, to try to understand precisely what it was that Brown was saying. I had a pretty good sense of it because I've read a lot of literature from this era, but you who maybe don't have as much experience, it was probably a little confusing to figure out what it was he said. So here are some of the examples of what I got from my OED searches. Um, so refuge, for example, I figure it's probably this one, an excuse, answer, approach, etc., in which a person takes refuge. That is, it's a metaphorical use of the word refuge. Um, often it's used with a derogatory implication, and because Brown is speaking in a derogatory fashion about certain kinds of reasoning, this feels like it's the, the use he's using here. And then we have this word, um, well, you see in the second one, in, under 1646, we have Brown himself in the Pseudodoxy Epidemica. So there I thought, well, that's probably Brown because there he is right there. Uh, and he uses the word recur. Um, it, it's a verb here to resort or have recourse to a person or other agent for assistance or argument. So again, it's a kind of metaphorical use, usage to run to or run back to. Uh, and then contrivance, it's obsolete use. You can see from the little, dagger here, ingenious adaptation or application obsolete. So with all that in mind, here's what I think um, this, this particular bit means. So again, here's the passage from Brown. Lastly, it is very injurious method into philosophy and perpetual promotion of ignorance to fall upon a present refuge unto miracles or recur unto immediate contrivance from the unsearchable hands of God. So I did that as Finally, it is a very harmful method for rational investigations. I think that's what he means by philosophy and a perpetual encouragement of ignorance to rely upon the available excuse of miracles or to resort to a ready at hand trick from the undiscernible acts of God. So trick is maybe not the right translation of contrivance there, but it basically means a kind of uh, logical kind of game almost, like just the sort of thing you produce because you don't have any anything else really that's going to work in terms of your reasoning. Uh, or to provide a loser paraphrase, it's bad for rational thought and in fact makes things worse to try to explain things through miracles or the claim that things happen directly from God because we can't observe divine causes. So this kind of paraphrase, this looser one that I'm offering up here is the kind of thing I'm going to ask you to do with this next much longer passage from Brown. And I'll warn you before I get to it that it's actually really difficult and I myself am still not quite sure what it means specifically even if I have a good sense of what it is that Brown is trying to accomplish. So here is that section. Certainly this is from the same paragraph towards the end of that section, explaining that donkeys have a cross mark on their coat because Christ once rode a donkey, something people believe, is a course more desperate than antipathies, sympathies, or occult qualities, wherein by a final and satisfactive discernment of faith, we lay the last and particular effects upon the first and general cause of all things, whereas in the other, we do but palliate our determinations until our advanced endeavors to totally reject or partially salve their evasions. You may think, what is he saying here? 
Well, I could help you out with a little, a little bit of this, right? What part of speech is this? Uh, is the word you're looking at? Is it a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb? Uh, Shakia talked about context clues in class the other day. That's also very useful. What do you think he's talking about? What positions do you expect the passage to take, right? Brown, you know, is a skeptic. Um, and so he's going to be skeptical about miracles. So if we go back to this, right, I've underlined the words that I think you particularly want to look up, but you may find that this is going to take a little while. Uh, so we, I've done this first sentence. Certainly this particular line of argument is a course more desperate than antipathies, sympathies, or occult qualities. So put it in modern English, certainly explaining the donkeys have a cross mark on their coat because Christ once rode a donkey is an argumentative method more reckless than relying on contrarieties or affinities of feeling or on secret qualities. So that thing about antipathies and sympathies is a reference to earlier points in his argument. And he's saying, as unscientific as those claims look, it's even less rational to try to say there's some miracle at the heart of this. It just doesn't work as an argument. So um, we have um, in these sections, that Brown that I had you read, I just want you to understand the larger arguments he's making because this will help you get a context for what he's trying to do. First off, in his discussion of dark skin color, he is arguing this, I'm going to quote him, thus having evinced, at least made dubious, the sun is not the author of this blackness. How and when this tincture first began is yet a riddle, and positively to determine it surpasses my presumption. He's saying, well, the sun doesn't cause it. Why it happens, I don't know. And you can say also why whiteness happens, I don't know. And I'm going to upload the PowerPoint. You can click on this link to look at Alexander Ross. His work, Arcana Microcosmia, or The Hid Secrets of Man's Body Discovered, with a refutation of Dr. Brown's vulgar errors. And there you can see several pages from a contemporary Brown where Ross is saying, no, actually, it is the sun. I'm absolutely certain it's the sun that causes it. So you see a debate here in the mid 17th century about, about this. Uh, which is quite fascinating. It's one we can trace at least through to the uh, the Anglo-African magazine from 1859. So he's also arguing this here, that there's this belief that's promulgated at least as early as the 17th century, that the sons of Noah, um, the, some of the sons turn out quite well, and one of his sons, Ham, embarrasses his father and his father curses him and his progeny and says, you're going to be the servants to, your progeny will be the servants to my other sons. And many people who want to support the enslavement of African people said, well, this is the origin of the justification for enslavement. Basically, God said this is okay because the people in Africa are descended from this particular son of Noah. Uh, and Brown says, this is just bad reasoning. It just doesn't work. It doesn't really line up with the Bible. The Bible doesn't actually say any of this. Um, and furthermore, is it true that blackness is actually a curse? And so he writes, lastly, whereas men affirm this color was a curse, I cannot make it out, make out the propriety of that name. It neither seeming so to them, that is to dark-skinned people, nor reasonably unto us, that is white-skinned people, for they take so much content their end or content therein, that they esteem deformity by other colors, describing the devil and terrible objects white. He also says, for beauty is determined by opinion and seems to have no essence that holds one notion with all, that seeming beauty is unto one, which hath no favor with another, and that unto every one accorded as custom has made it natural or sympathy and conformity of mind shall make it seem agreeable. So thus flat noses seem comely unto the more, an aquiline or hawk one unto the Persian, a large or prominent nose unto the Roman, but none of all of these are acceptable in our opinion, that is the opinions of the English. Basically he's saying, well, people want to say, white people want to say that black skin is a curse. Well, black people don't seem to think that black skin is a curse. Um, secondly, the white people want to say, well, it's clearly ugly. And Brown says, everybody, decides beauty, what beauty is on the basis of what they're familiar with. And so we can look at the shapes of noses, for example, and look how the ideal shape of a nose differs by, well, the region of where people live. So 
that seems like a legitimate argument, right? And it's one that Alexander Ross is not going to refute. He's going to focus specifically on the sun. So um, for more on this thing about Ham, um, because this history of the interpretation of the Bible is really fascinating, there's a very good article by a fellow named Benjamin Brode, or Brode, uh, The Sons of Noah and the Construction of Ethnic and Geographical Identities in the Medieval and Early Modern Periods from uh, an academic journal called the William and Mary Quarterly from 1997. So it's already 23 years old. And one of the things that Broad points out in the article is that certainly in the later Middle Ages, there wasn't really a lot of certainty about who Ham was or what Ham's, who Ham's descendants were. So modern people who want to justify slavery said, well, Ham's descendants are clearly dark-skinned Africans. In the Middle Ages, though, they often said, well, Ham is the father of Asians. Shem is the father of Africans. Japheth is the father of Europeans. Um, Ham is the father of the Khan and the Mongols. Shem is the ancestor of the, of the Muslims. And Japheth, the progenitor of the Europeans and the Jews. Right, so it's very, there's a history to the interpretation of who these sons are, and that history is, it's constantly changing because of course it's basically a myth. So it's gonna have a real strong cultural bias. Okay, so um, let's, um, let's then talk about the uh, Christina Malcolmson. Uh, I'm going to ask you to be able to answer these questions uh, in class on Thursday. Um, you've read three reviews of Christina Malcolmson's studies of skin color in the early Royal Society, Boyle, Cavendish, Swift. Um, and I'm asking you, what's a theory of polygenesis? Is it the same as pre-atomism? Uh, because this is defined and discussed in every review you've read because it's a central uh, set of terms for Malcolmson's book. What was the Royal Society? What is she's writing about? And finally, since Malcolmson's writing about this person, what kinds of beliefs did the novelist, philosopher, and poet Margaret Cavendish have about skin color and why? Um, you can learn that from these reviews. So in the closing, let me offer up uh, some of the responses that you're offering on your Google Forms. So here's an example of a good response to Harrison. There are many good responses. So I ask, well, look at the sentences in the paragraph ending right before Gali Redendo Fidem Frangud and tell me a bit about how Harrison is suspicious of too much intelligence. So someone says, I was confused by this section of the piece, but I think that Harrison is wary and suspicious of too much intelligence because intelligence can be disguised for duplicity. And yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. And I really like that this person said, I was confused. I'm not sure, but I think this is what's going on. I really like that sort of um, faith in saying, well, I'm just going to give this a shot and see how it works. In fact, it works perfectly. Um, and, you know, I want you to be able to take some risks, particularly in an assignment like this, where I'm just grading you on whether or not you do it, right? So this is, this is interesting. Um, then um, somebody else answers like this. Harrison shows how suspicious he is of too much intelligence by writing the British people being supposedly not intelligent, intelligent causes them to be in accordance with each other, thus trusting each other fully and avoiding suspicion amongst themselves. He then states that intelligence and wisdom is a cloak for scheming behavior. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it interesting, right, um, that there's a discussion in Harrison where he's trying to establish basically a racial division between the English and everybody else. And typically the person who claims to be on top of the racial hierarchy will typically say, yes, but we're the most intelligent. But Harrison is not doing that. He's in fact saying intelligence is kind of bad. I don't really, no, I don't really truck with it because you can't trust people who are too smart. Um, and so then we have this here. Um, so I, I was asking about definitions. Uh, I said, can you define the word politic in this passage here? And everyone's familiar with it because he did this. And somebody responds, here politic means smart or sharp. Yeah, exactly, perfect. Harrison is saying that those who practice fraud, dishonesty, and sly cheating in their affairs and are deemed intelligent and, and wise, and that he'd rather not be wise if that's what that means. Yeah, exactly, and it's fascinating. So you can find, in fact, in 21st century racist discourse, particularly among white supremacists who say, I'm not a white supremacist, many of them will say, because I think Asian people are actually smarter than white people. And I say to that, no, you're still a white supremacist because it has to do with your bizarre opinions about intelligence. And I think that part probably participates in an idea that intel too much intelligence remains suspicious. The same white supremacists often have the same opinion about Jews, in fact. So 
uh, these things have a very long set of beliefs with terrible effects. So um, some summaries so far of what we've co covered. In the opening days of class, we've seen various theories of difference about skin color, various arguments about skin color and human hierarchies ranging from the late 16th century through to the mid 19th century. Some of these opinions, Jefferson, Emerson, and the work in the Anglo-African magazine in 1859 are coincidental with the US being an economy built on enslaved people. So they're totally part of that world, right? Jefferson is completely on board with, with slavery as an economic system. Emerson maybe is not, but he's certainly not gonna fight against it. The Anglo-African magazine, unsurprisingly, is taking an abolitionist and anti-racist approach. Uh, because it's being written by Black people. Number four, some of these opinions, Brown, date to the very early period of an English involvement in slave labor, <coughs> which we can talk about later in class on Thursday and also over the next few weeks. And some of these opinions, Harrison, writing in the 1580s or so, predate English involvement in slave labor altogether. And that helps explain why, really, he's focusing more on the French and the Spanish than he is on Black people, although he does talk a little bit about Black people. So that's it for today. I'm hoping you had a chance to watch this video. Thanks.